All right, let's get started. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Betancourt from uh, um, the Department of Biotechnology of Un Universidad Ort in Uruguay, Montevideo. Uh, she's been there since 2010. She received uh, a PhD in biochemistry from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in molecular biology. Then she went through several postdoc positions at uh, Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education and the School of Civil Engineering at Georgia Tech and Biochemistry, Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge. Uh, after that, uh, she moved again in 2010 to uh, Universidad Orte in Uruguay. Uh, she focused her scientific career on enzymology and biocatalysis. She will be talking to us today about uh, biomimetic silica-based uh, nanobiocatalysts. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Um, as it's been said, I work at the Department of Biotechnology in Universidad Orti Montevideo. Um, our research group mainly focuses in biocatalysis and uh, specifically in heterogeneous biocatalysis, which is a um, fancy way to say that we attach enzymes to different materials and we put them to work in vitro. So um, my uh, talk today is about uh, a type of material that we use for this, to prepare this nanobiocatalyst. But uh, first, let me give you a framework uh, to understand, for you to understand why um, we are interested in this area of biocatalysis, uh, um, the advantages over uh, synthesis with um, um, conventional chemical processes are a, a lot. Uh, biocatalysis are, is environmentally friendly and uh, uh, it has the advantage of, of producing molecules in the absence of side products uh, under very mild conditions and with no, <laughs> uh, I said, with no uh, protection and the protection steps. Uh, historically, it has been seen as a a way to produce molecules industrially, but um, uh, in more recent years, and thanks to the development of um, um, devices, micro and nano devices, um, it's also seen as a discovery tool for new functional molecules. Basically, one could create nano micro reactors with um, uh, enzymes and challenge them with non-natural substrates to create new molecule, molecules with potential biological um, uh, activity. So um, that being said, it seems that uh, enzymes are perfect um, biosynthetic entities, but they have a lot of disadvantages to be used uh, in vitro or industrially. Um, because the enzymes have been evolved to work in, the, in a cell environment. Of course, they are soluble, and they are used to work at a certain pH, at a certain temperature, with the aid of other molecules within the cells. And uh, that gives enzymes certain disadvantages, such as limited stability, difficulty of separation, product contamin contamination, and limited reuse at uh, in vitro use. And there are many, many um, tools that we could use to, to improve the enzymes to work uh, ex vivo. And one of those tools is um, uh, enzyme immobilization, which would give you the possibility to, to stabilize the enzyme structure, sometimes even change the, the, the properties of the, of the, the enzymologic uh, properties of the biocatalyst. And um, of course, uh, as you are insolubilizing the enzyme now, you are able to separate easily the, the biocatalyst from the reaction media. Within those um, matrices that we test for enzyme immobilization, nano size supports are especially interesting because they have certain properties that are highlighted over there, especially a large surface area uh, where you can um, immobilize a lot of enzymes and have uh, m much more um, en 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 enzyme units per gram of uh, catalyst. So one of the of these nanosupports that uh, we use in our lab 
is a type of silica that uh, whose synthesis is mimicked is mimicking what uh, diatoms do in nature <coughs> and um, uh, in the late 90s, uh, Niels Kroger was able to um, elucidate the molecular basis for this, this uh, um, the silica deposition in these um, beautiful structures that you see there that uh, uh, diatoms are able to form. And he found out that there was a, there was a specific uh, a molecule, a specific type of protein uh, which had an unusual a uh, high, high number of amino groups that was catalyzing the, or was uh, involved in the deposition of silica in these organisms. The same, uh, um, this synthetic um, procedure was um, um, done also in vitro using many different aminated molecules with success. In fact, uh, it was found that what was important was to have amino groups that would act as um, a, a, acid, um, acid base uh, catalysts for the formation of siloxans, having after the amino groups integrated in the silica matrix. And more or less, uh, what you would obtain after mixing a source of silicon and hydrolyzed source of silicon and an, an aminated molecule, it could be these um, uh, nanomaterials that I'm showing in the slide. So a number of, of uh, let's say in the early 2000, a number of uh, uh, enzymes and, and uh, proteins as antibody had been um, uh, entrapped in this kind of uh, material as it is very mild and uh, it's easy to perform <coughs> as um, only by mixing the protein or the enzyme with the reagents for the synthesis, you get a, a, an immobilization process. It has been uh, also used uh, in flow through applications, but uh, just uh, to highlight this, the, the advantages of this uh, process for immobilization, we can say it's very quick. It's, uh, one mix everything, and in seconds, you have a precipitation, a silica deposition, and that is easily um, separated by centrifugation. It's quite mild, and because it's, uh, the synthesis is, is it's mild, it's compatible with the um, enzyme or protein uh, activity. Uh, it's nano size, it could be degraded after the enzyme is uh, inactive. Um, it's quite robust, um, stabilizing for numerous uh, different enzymes. And by varying conditions during synthesis, some researchers had been able to um, create other structures apart from nanoparticles. So, um, they have certain disadvantages for, for uh, biocatalysis. I've shown you that the material that is formed uh, actually um, creates um, a, a, like merge particles that, that would decrease uh, the surface area. So um, it could also uh, create uh, possible alterations in the enzyme activity after entrapment. So we first try to um, improve uh, the physical properties of this material for the use uh, as a, a immobilization support for enzymes. And our hypothesis was that if we uh, introduce a, a, um, a protein template during the synthesis, we might be able to generate, uh, generate poly, uh, monodispersed and loose particles and smaller particles of, this, of these materials. So this is a material that is formed with a, a regular synthesis. Uh, we had a, a hydrodynamic uh, a size of uh, 798. You can see that it's quite polymorphous. And uh, when we uh, introduce uh, BSA during the synthesis of the, of the material, material, we were able to um, produce a material that was much more um, a, um, um, 
similar in, term, in terms of size and shapes of what we were obtained and uh, uh, to reduce the, the diameter of, of, of the particles. So once we um, knew how to improve the physical properties of this material, now I want to uh, tell you about uh, two, two different stories related to the preparation of the nanobiocatalyst that we are developing in our lab. The first story is about the immobilization of lipases. Lipases are one of the most, or I would say the most used enzyme in biotechnology. Uh, we uh, specifically were studying its um, application in the synthesis of biodiesel. Um, enzymatic biodiesel is something that is uh, currently done in, in many companies around around the world, as of course it's much more environmentally friendly than than the um, biodiesel, chemical biodiesel, biodiesel preparation. And there are uh, companies such as Novozymes and others that are pr producing um, immobilized lipases. So our strategy to immobilize lipase on this material was by entrapment. As I said before, mixing everything and get it inside the particle. And also we prepare the, uh, the material and functionalize it with two different functional groups, uh, uh, long uh, carbonated chains to uh, uh, get a first hydrophobic absorption of the, of the enzyme on the surface. Um, lipases are quite good at absorbing to hydrophobic surfaces. In fact, it's what they, they do on, the, on their substrates because they act on fats. And um, a sec second group was a aldehyde group that were introduced, of course, by silanization that uh, could uh, then, in a second step, immobilize the enzyme covalently to the surface. So we end up with two different nanobiocatalysts, an entrapped one, a surface, surface immobilized one. I won't enter into detail here, but uh, for the entrapment, we follow an experiment of factorial design to see uh, uh, in which conditions we had uh, much more uh, activity after the entrapment and much more uh, and more weight of catalyst. You can see that in there are certain um, uh, reactions that ha have a synergistic effect in the, acti in the final activity and the weight of the catalyst obtained, we finally select one in which the specific activity that we have, meaning we had more activity per milligram of catalyst, um, uh, was uh, high. For the other strategy in which we, are, we were attaching the enzyme on the surface, we started the, the loading capacity as, as one would study with any other material. Uh, and uh, we achieve a, a bit better um, um, specific activity than with the entrapped um, uh, approach. Both gave, a, gave us a size of around 500 nanometers. And you can see that um, the polydispersity here, uh, it's uh, also uh, quite important. Uh, uh, we done, we attempt this um, immobilization with different enzymes, especially for the entrapment. We know now that the, the um, um, composition of the surface of the enzyme plays a role in the formation of the, of the particles. So sometimes even very small enzymes give you uh, large diameter nanoparticles uh, following this synthetic strategy. So we, we evaluate then the stability of, of, of our nanobiocatalyst uh, when proposing uh, enzymes to work at industrial scale. It's key to have a good stability, not only in the conditions uh, um, where the reaction is going to um, take place, but also uh, a shelf life stability. We, you can see here, we tried different concentrations of enzyme. This is the entrap um, enzyme. Uh, and we um, compared it with the um, stability of the soluble enzyme and with the commercially immobilized 
enzyme, the, the very same en enzyme from, from novel science. Uh, our preparations, um, our entrapped preparations were much more stable. In the case of the surface immobilized uh, enzyme, we also have stable preparations compared with the soluble enzyme, but we were beaten by the <laughs> immobilized uh, preparation from novel science. However, when we try the actual conversion of uh, or biosynthesis of um, biodiesel, we uh, find out that the surface uh, immobilized lead base um, uh, outperform quite significantly the commercial immobilized lead base. And it also happened with the entrapped lead base. So uh, it means that this uh, type of uh, material resist um, uh, resist um, much better um, the, the, con the synthetic conditions that the commercial immobilized lead base. Um, it is important to say that in these in this conditions, the enzyme is working uh, uh, in, in an hydrous environment. So the, the, the material was able to resist the anhydrous environment and probably keep uh, a certain amount of, um, of, of water, um, uh, not enough to generate hydrolysis, hydrolysis because there was no hydrolysis in this, in this reaction, but also, but uh, uh, it was a very good performance in, term, in terms of, of a synthesis of biodiesel. The surface immobilized lipase was also evaluated in repeated batch operation with uh, very good accumulated uh, specific productivity uh, after five, five um, uh, repeated parts. So this is one, one story. Sorry. Yeah. Are you, are you saying that this, these different batches are reusing the same? Exactly. Yeah. So basically, we um, uh, perform a complete synthesis, and we separate the catalyst, and we perform another another batch. Yeah. So the the activity is decreasing. The enzyme is suffering a bit, but still, you could reuse it five times with uh, uh, at least uh, twenty percent yield in the reaction. So next story, a very short story, uh, the case of the synthesis of butyrosine. Butyrosine B is an aminoglycoside antibiotic that it's very important because uh, it's, um, it's used in the resistant bacteria to the uh, um, common normal antibiotics. Uh, it's produced naturally by a pathway of eight different enzymes. And we were using here two, the two last enzymes that luckily are quite promiscuous and are able to accept uh, synthetic substrates. So this comes back a bit uh, to what I say first on biocatalysis. We want this system to be able to perform in a, in a micro platform to challenge um, the system with um, synthetic non-natural substrates to see if we could have alternate, alternate versions of butyrosine B with putative biological activity. So we tried different um, uh, strategies of immobilization and co-immobilization, co-entrapment, entrapment of each of the, of the enzymes separately, and uh, also on the surface of, the, of this material um, uh, separately and uh, together on the, same, on the same nanoparticle. And what we proved was that uh, we had, we were able to produce butyrosine B only when these uh, enzymes were co-immobilized or co-entrapped. Actually, here you can see that um, in this separately entrapped um, strategy, we had some product, but at, this, at a certain um, when when here we have a full conversion, um, in this case, we still had intermediates of the reaction. Okay, so um, uh, I, I'm just showing this to um, uh, um, 
highlight the, the fact that this strategy of um, you know, uh, immobilizing and co-immobilizing and co-entrapment enzymes, it is very important for um, enzymatic systems, which is now one of the fields that is developing with a, a lot of strength in biocatalysis to integrate different um, uh, uh, steps to uh, um, obtain um, uh, more uh, elaborated products. Okay, third and last um, story. Uh, we are working on directed enzymatic product therapy, which is the use of enzymes to generate a drug in situ, localized uh, in the place where you want it to act, actually. So uh, it uh, works because uh, the enzyme is able to um, uh, convert a prodrug which has no secondary effect on the system and uh, it has to convert it in uh, the place where it's needed, right? So for that, normally um, researchers use an external stimuli to trigger the activity of the enzyme localized in that, in that uh, place. Other uh, researchers, of course, use uh, uh, directed vectorization, such as antibodies, for example. What uh, we actually want to do is to create uh, or we have done, is to create a nano-hybrid material that integrates uh, magnetic nanoparticles, enzyme, and a silica shell that entrap the enzyme close to the nanoparticle. We have selected HRP, a uh, uh, horseradish peroxidase, that is able to uh, convert three indole acetic acid, which is a plant hormone, it has uh, no biological activity or toxicity in our body, and it creates uh, toxic radicals because it oxi oxidizes randomly the three indole acetic acid, inducing apoptosis in cancer cells. But why we want to have uh, magnetic nanoparticles there? Well, we want to have it because we want to apply an external stimuli that make uh, this conversion from prodrug to drug selectively where we applied an, alternate, an alternating magnetic field. So by applying the AMF, what we are trying to do is to increase the temperature in the vicinity of the enzyme, reach its optimal temperature, and uh, uh, accelerate the conversion of this uh, prodrug to drug localized in a lo localized way. So for that, we have studied the immobilization of the entrap. We are working in collaboration with a, a, a Spanish group here. Uh, and uh, we, um, in Montevideo, we optimize the immobilization of all these um, different uh, hybrids and evaluate them, characterize them. And uh, Spain is uh, uh, the Spanish group is the one that has this alternate alternate magnetic field uh, equipment uh, to evaluate the performance of the, the enzyme in cells, in animals, etc. So uh, what we've done here is uh, just entrap the H HRP in silica. We have also uh, follow a different strategy. Okay, we have followed a different strategy in which we oxidize first the enzyme, entrap it, and then covalently at attach it to the matrix in a three-dimensional way with the amino groups remaining from the catalyst for the synthesis of the silica. So the enzyme not only becomes entrapped, but also covalently attached to that matrix, uh, uh, looking for a better uh, stability of the, of the catalyst. And of course, we've also done the same thing, introducing the magnetic nanoparticles. All the preparations have a good uh, immobilization of the enzyme and uh, were not um, affecting dramatically the uh, activity of the enzyme after the immobilization.
So uh, you can see uh, there's something I forgot to say here. We've also followed uh, this strategy, add adding uh, trialose in the preparation media, which is a well-known stabilizer for uh, enzymes. And um, uh, this is uh, uh, analysis by scanning electron microscopy of, of all the preparations we had. Trialose added a bit of polydispersity to the material we, we had. And um, here you can see a thermal stability experiment in which um, you see here, this is a soluble enzyme in the first figure. Um, the entrap enzyme, and then the different preparations immobilized, and uh, it turns out that the um, nano hybrid that contained the magnetic nanoparticles was 280 uh, times more stable than the soluble en the enzyme. So in terms of stability, we were quite good. We wanted to test uh, the conversion of this pro drug with our nano hybrid, which, uh, which uh, was also quite uh, successful. You can see here the decrease in the amount of the 3 indole acetic acid. And this is a uh, radical that is uh, mostly produced by, by the oxidation, which is this oxindole carbinol. We prove also that uh, this um, hybrid had a magnetic behavior. And uh, finally, we um, applied, um, we tested them with um, an external uh, AMF. Um, and in this experiment, while the overall uh, temperature of the solution was 25 degrees, the enzyme was behaving with a uh, rate of conversion above 45 degrees, which meant that we were increasing locally the temperature and um, uh, facilitating the, the, the conversion of the substrate. This is just to show you that we have uh, done also uh, cytotoxicity experiments. Uh, the nanoparticles by themselves are not um, cytotoxic, cytotoxic, sorry. And uh, when uh, in the present, sorry, this is um, um, uh, maybe too confusing, but uh, we um, uh, run experiment with the substrate in which uh, we have here controls uh, of uh, controls of live cells. Uh, we have uh, uh, controls with uh, H soluble HRP and uh, in the presence of substrate and HRP alone. And these are our hybrids in which we tested different um, um, nanoparticle concentrations and uh, substrate concentrations. And you can see that there are uh, several conditions in, in which the um, viability of the cells are uh, quite reduced. OK, so now uh, I would like to thank uh, the fi funding agencies for this uh, project, which are ANI, uh, the Center of Biotechnology, Bio Bio Research and Development in Biotechnology, PSIVA, of course, my university and uh, Nano, uh, Nano Immunotech is a company in Spain that is uh, working with us in, in the development of this um, uh, nano hybrid for, for direct enzyme therapy. And uh, uh, the group from Dr. Valeria Arasu at the Institute of Nanoscience in Aragon. Dan for helping me <laughs> visit Montreal. Carlos Aninetti, which is the, the director of the Department of Biotechnology. Lorena Wilson was uh, also collaborating with me in the uh, immobilization of lead bases. And uh, my students, uh, that, uh, especially Sonali, Erien, and Diego, who uh, were involved in the results that uh, I showed. And now, Uruguay. I hope you know where it is. It's a small country in South America really small compared to Canada and to its neighbors. Uh, you can come, you are welcome to come. To, you can see there's nice beaches, uh, green, blue skies, everything. And uh, my lab, if you are willing to work hard, you can come to, <laughs> to my lab in Montevideo. And these are all the people that work in the department. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting talk. So, uh, questions? The microphone works. Yeah, it's just for the recording. <coughs> yeah, thank you. That was <coughs> really fascinating. Fascinating. So, thank you. just I didn't get a part of it. The first, I mean, the big picture is to immobilize those enzymes on a silica nanoparticle. Yeah. Yes. So, but you said you mix some chemicals together and they're going to get immobilized. Yes. That's one, uh, that's one of the approaches. And just because all the methods that I know contain some harsh exactly. thing this, in it? Yeah. The, so this is a good thing about this strategy. The strategy uh, for the synthesis is done at pH 8, at room temperature, ambient conditions on top of your bench. You mix uh, TMOS, hydrolyzed TMOS or TEOS as a source of silica. You mix uh, some phosphate buffer with your uh, enzyme and an aminated molecule, which could be a peptide, could be a polymer such as polyethylenamine, uh, really whatever uh, molecule you can think of with a uh, uh, determined number of uh, amino groups, and it polymerizes quickly. It actually catalyzes the soil shell production. If you, if you leave the TMOS in HCL, you will end up with a, with a salt gel. But uh, as you are adding the aminated molecule, you um, uh, fasten that, uh, that reaction and make it precipitate into nanoparticles. So if the enzyme is mixed there, it will become entrapped in the nanoparticles that you have prepared. So the enzyme is physically entrapped, it's not chemically bond to the silica, yeah? So, if it has, so I showed that uh, amino groups become integrated in the silica. If it has amino groups in the surface, uh, in the enzyme surface, it probably becomes also attached. But uh, we also proved that uh, if you do additional chemical modification for uh, um, chemical bonding to the matrix, you even improve better the stability of the enzyme. It means that you are improving the rigidity to a certain point that is not detrimental to the enzymatic activity, but it's good to keep the stability. So it's physically, chemically, I would say. Any idea how much the naturation would, would the lipase, for instance, experience when you immobilize it on nanoparticles? Uh, uh, so uh, we had, after entrapment, you said? Uh, we, or on the surface. Or on the surface. Yeah, we, we uh, lost around 20-30% of the activity that we were um, applying. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that bad if you are able to reuse that. Uh, so it, you have to compensate that with the possibility of, uh, of reusing. So I, I have a quick question. Yes. So um, uh, the atoms are porous. They have a large surface to volume um, ratio. So the, in, in some of the drawings, the, uh, the silica um, um, Spheres, they showed some porosity. Is that? Yeah, but I, we, we, I, I wasn't able to see that in the EM images. Or yeah, the porosity is between 2.5 and 4 nanometers. That's what uh, we found out when when we were synthesizing it with a BSA. But I have to say we haven't um, evaluated the porosity with other enzymes. That might change because we know. You know, at least the diameter is changing a lot, and it's not directly related to the diameter of the of the protein. I'm guessing that uh, because we are not actually uh, entrapping only one protein molecule, we, we entrap. So that depends on how prone to to create uh, aggreg aggregates uh, in solution. Uh, so the other question I had is, it seems that it's uh, working so well for biodiesel. 
um, compared to industrial methods. So what are the roadblocks when, you, when this needs to be scaled up? What are the challenges you mean to yes. scale? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we are working uh, with that with the bioengineering department in at uh, the Pontificia Universidad in Chile. Um, so, uh, challenges are scaling up the production of the nanobiocatalyst, and uh, we are testing, we are evaluating, you know, optimizing it. We've done this in batch conditions in, in, in bench tops so, uh, experiments. So we really have to evaluate, uh, uh, you know, in a bioreactor. We haven't done that. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, and you showed these comparisons of the entrapment or the surface. So, but can you summarize by saying one is always better than the other, or? No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I can't generalize. That's that would be my answer. Uh, so it depends on because, particular yeah, application. Yeah, because uh, I, I wanted to show you that uh, in the case of the lipase, uh, we had much better thermal stability when entrapped for the lipase. But the conversion under anhydrous condition was much better with the surface immobilized lipase. So for hydrolytic uh, conversions of lipase, maybe it's better to have it entrapped. For this specific uh, synthetic of uh, fatty acid methyl ester reaction, uh, it's, it's better the surface immobilized. I'm sure there are physical aspect, uh, to, to aspects to, to, to evaluate that can lead us to, you know, to, to, to a conclusion on why it's behaving like that, but uh, we really don't know. And uh, what we do know is that yeah, the enzyme immobilization is quite empirical. <laughs> um, there are some rational approaches that can be done, but uh, in the end, you have to test the behavior in the conditions that you want to perform the conversion and see uh, what is uh, best. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so uh, I think if I'm not wrong, uh, the sizes of the nanoparticles you're using were close to 200, 300 nan nanometers. Some of them are bigger. A bigger yeah. 400. So, so what ha what about uh, using a whole cell biocatalyst, like a whole cell bacteria expressing uh, recombinant enzyme? Yeah, uh, we try. We uh, we can uh, actually we cannot uh, we could not entrap whole cells within the material. Somehow during the synthesis, the material formed and the bacteria was, uh, uh, you know, outside the particles. But what we are trying now is to entrap them with other uh, uh, usual um, agarose uh, or agar particle immobilization strategy and grow silica on top of it because the problem of this kind of entrapment is for, for these conversions is that they are not physically resistant to um, uh, agitate, agitation and so on and so forth. So the silica might uh, um, uh, harden the, the material. So we are we are doing that, but for sure they are not uh, nano size. They are. Um, I do have one more question. So um, I was. <laughs> I, I don't think I understood very well what you meant. You had a slide where you showed squid computing, or yes. So, um, is it possible to get a bit more details on that? Um, is yeah, it this possible? One. So yeah, this way. Squid uh, device. So, what is the role of the uh, silica in? No. So we wanted to prove that uh, in our silica particles we had integrated the magnetic particles. Okay. That's uh, that's okay. A, it's a proof that we we have uh, a, um, a magnetism in the, in those particles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are no other questions. Yes, one more question. So for the uh, in body drug development part, you said. So one of the problems with normal magnetic cancer therapy with these things is that their concentration is so low. So with these, 
enzyme immobilization method? Can you just immobilize antibodies on the surface and, then, and just immobilize thousands of magnetic nanoparticles? So yeah, you could you could uh, um, uh, immobilize on the surface uh, specific antibodies or peptides that would uh, direct the, the particles to the specific site. Yeah, you, we could do that. A challenge with this uh, with this type of material now is uh, that we are very hard working on it. Is the aggregation that you have. Uh, in complex matrices, just as uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 blood or things like that. So, right now we are we are optimizing conditions to functionalize the surface in such a way that does not um, absorb any protein. Uh, but and but the reaction uh, stops after you making these particles because I mean you said you can just add some proteins at pH around seven to eight room temperatures, and in these conditions, they're going to immobilize, but that's sort of close to the what's in the body. And in the blood, we have tons of proteins. So, I mean, maybe it gets covered by a protein corona? Yeah, we, um, we perform a washing with a high salt uh, concentration, and yeah, okay. because it actually sticks, some of the proteins that are not entrapped, they stick to the surface, okay. uh, because it's highly um, positive. So. Um, we we have, but we proved that also that uh, uh, you have to wash it with a high um, a NaCl uh, solution, and you remove all the proteins from the from the surface. But then, of course, it will be necessary to functionalize it, depending on the applications that you you have. Other questions? Thank you again for a very interesting talk. Thank you.